Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, and I am the Cornelius Vanderbilt and Dow Chair Professor of Fine Arts at Vanderbilt University, from where I am addressing you in the ancestral land of Native American people, and also with the permission of my ancestral people, descendants of Africa in this part of the world. I am welcoming you today to the continuum of the webinars of EADJ and specifically the topic of public art as network between dispersed geographies. I am thinking that this is an important topic in a moment in which we are talking about both monuments, memorials, and also coming across significant important social and complexity of our present moment. In my mind, there are few ideas or few things that I have been thinking to share with you in this morning. For once, the memory of my father, my aunts, and my mother, all dressed in jute, sacks, clothing, every Wednesday of my early years of my life. So this Wednesday, April 21st, from here in Nashville, this visual image of a skin of black descendants dressed in burlap, celebrating the Yoruba people in Cuba is still present with me. In my mind also is a number of important historical landmarks in our history in the United States of America. January 16, 1960, 1865, when the law of 40 acres, 40 acres and a mule was ordered in war, civil war period. 1941, January 6, when FDR proposed to our nation the idea of four important freedoms, for a speech, for worship, from want and from fear. Important core ideas about what was envisioned at the moment, a perfect union. In January 15, 1979, when James Baldwin in Berkeley, California, proposed to all of us that it was one fundamental thing that was clear in our nation, that in the conversation of racial reckoning between black and white, one thing was very clear. White American didn't want to be black American. And that is still maybe seem pertinent for us. January 6, 2020, we saw a symbol of racism again being flown in the hall of the Capitol, the People House, when the Confederate flag enter that recent of precious place for conversation of equality. And again, as an affront to the long battle for social justice in our country. I think that between winters and summers, we have seen over the years, fundamental manifestation of some of the more pivotal battles in our country. So let me move to May 25, 2020, and we were bear witness of a terrible incident again of violation of the human rights in the body of George Floyd. Today, a day after the verdict that we received yesterday, I see myself in a less celebratory mood as maybe we would consider that justice was service, but more trouble with a fundamental question. If in America, every time that we may want to step forward to justice, it implies the immolation of the body of a black or a woman or a male, how far have we have moved in the really considering and accessing the freedom, the equality, the geographical right of the body of black individual to be respected and to be considered in all his potentiality and capacity in the world. So with these ideas in mind, I think too, in the fundamental work that we are proposed to do in EADJ about art, democracy, and justice, and the fact that two very important moments in our history has been captured, nevertheless, but the land, but this fundamental tool used not only in journalism, but too in the arts. It was through a camera 
that we saw over and over again the beating of Rodney King in the 90s. And it was through a camera that we have the testimony and we have the evidence, not only of what we see in television, but for generations to come of that pivotal and terrifying moment of the lynching of George Floyd in the street of Minneapolis. So let's let art be a tool that not only inscribe aspiration of justice, but also the record for the generations after us. But important moment in our daily survival in America. I want to thank our speakers, Elvira, Cecilia, our curator, Marina, Paul Taylor, professor from Vanderbilt, Yamal Chid, professor from Fisk University. In this conversation today, as well, Ibrahim, who joined us today. Let me close saying that behind us, there are a number of people that make this program possible. And also to say too, that we have translation to Spanish. Please, anybody using that, be sure that you use the icon with the glove in the bottom of your screen and choose interpretation. Finally, again, let me thank to two important women who made EADJ possible in 2018 when we launched the program. Susan Wented, Provost of Vanderbilt, and Susan Edwards, Director Emeritus of Fritz Museum. Uh, I welcome you and let the program start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda, for these moving words and this moving introduction. It's been a year, um, almost a year, and that we have been discussing and working for the um, engine of our democracy and justice. And every time I hear Magda opening up the sessions, it's very hard to follow uh, with meaningful words. Nevertheless, hello everyone and welcome and thank you for being with us today in episode 11 of a Engine of Our Democracy and Justice, a trajectory which started last fall thanks to Professor Magda Campos Pons, the founder, the soul, the spirit, the flesh and bone of the whole endeavor. My immense gratitude goes to all the institutions and the individuals that behind this program to the distinguished participants that they are together with us in this conversation, which is about to start, and above all to Magda, that gathers us all together under this program that we titled Living in Common in the Precarious Souths. Easier said than done. Today's episode signals the event of the new major public art installation of the Ghanaian artist, international renowned artist, Ibrahim Mahama, on the grounds of Fisk University. Commissioned almost a year ago as part of this year's program, Mahama installation, a set of jute sacks marked by the sweat, the tears, the laughter, the handprints of a large number of individuals around the globe forms a living monument of dispersed geographies, a monument of oppression and struggles, and together a fresh um, a set of fresh networks based on empathy and resonance. Wrapped around the little theater in Fisk University, we hope that Mahama's work will offer a site for more discussions on colonialism and systemic racism can be amplified. Today's episode, as Magda was also discussing, coincide with George uh, Taylor's murderer pleaded guilty Unlike so many other murderers who killed so many other black people since more than over hundreds years from now. Racism was the main target of Du Bois polemics and he strongly protested against lynching, against Jim Crow's laws and the discrimination in education and the employment. It is rather moving and it has been a kind of a responsibility and a duty, I feel, to somehow have Ibrahim Mahama present from Accra to Fisk University, where socialist historian, historian civil rights ar uh, archivist and pan-Africanist W.E. Dubai studied and from where he was active uh, from. It's almost like an entopic justice, considering that in October 1961, 
93 years old Du Bois and his wife traveled to Ghana to commence working on the Encyclopedia Africana that was going to be sponsored and paid by the Ghanaian government. Then two years after, in 1963, the United States refused to renew Du Bois' passport. So he made the symbolic gesture of becoming a citizen of Ghana, and eventually he died in August of 1963, that year in the capital of Accra. So back to our real public art or art in the public space as a way to bring disperse geographies and histories in proximity is, a broad, is broadly the focus of this episode. And before all, some questions come in one's mind. And the questions are, what consists the public space and how it has been transformed in our days? What does public art means or signifies for whom it is and why? And what consists the public? Who is the public? Who are the various publics marked by insisting presences and repeated absences? How art history or art histories have been morphing the prevailing cultural aesthetics, restricting or allowing varied publics to be represented? And is there any restorative action that can be taken towards this? With no further ado, I would like to present our honorable speakers who would reflect in this uh, issues. So with us today, we have Cecilia Alemani, which is the artistic director of the upcoming Venice Biennale, the 59th. And since 2011, she has been the Donald R. Mullen Jr. Director and Chief Curator of Highline Art, the public art program presented by the Highline in New York. Elvira Giangani Jose, which is an independent curator and who currently serves as the director of the showroom gallery in London and teaches as a lecturer in the visual cultures at Goldsmiths University. Uh, Elvira recently served as senior curator of Creative Times, a New York based non for profit public arts organization, and she's a member of the Thought Council of the Fondazione Prada. Jamal Sheets, which is a director and the curator of Fisk University Galleries and as an assistant professor in the Fisk University Art Department and an honorable member of um, the Engine of Art, Democracy and Justice. Paul C. Taylor, which is the W. Anton Jones Professor of Philosophy and Professor of African American and Diaspora Studies at Vanderbilt University. His research focuses primarily on aesthetics, social and political philosophy, critical race, theory, and Africana philosophy. And his books include On Obama and Black is Beautiful, A Philosophy of Black Aesthetics. And Ibrahim Mahama, a Ghana-based internationally renowned artist who uses the transformation of material to explore themes of commodity, migration, globalization, and economic exchange. Often make in collaboration with others, his large scale installation employing materials gathered from urban environments, such as jute sacks, which are stitched together and draped over architectural structures. And one of these works is the work that will open tomorrow in Fisk University, uh, wrapped around the little theater in the grounds of Fisk University, in the grounds of Nashville. To, here, I have to add that the, the suings for this work took place in Vanderbilt University, in Fisk, Fisk University, and in Magruer Resource Center. So we are very um, honored, we are very grateful to every person that took part in the sewing and the making of this immense installation. But let's go to our discussion. And I would like to ask Jamal Sheets that as we are broadcast from Nashville, Tennessee, it's important that you ground us to, to, the, to the Fisk University and share with us your work in there and your observations vis-a-vis -vis the aforementioned questions. Good afternoon, Jamal. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, first, let me just start with gratitude and it's such a pleasure to, to, to have been a part of this project from the beginning and then also to share this platform with so many wonderful critical thinkers and amazing minds. Um, to kind of begin to unpack this, these, these ideas, I think we have to go back just a little bit to last year where we first started thinking about refining or redefining monuments, where Carrie Mae Weems challenged us to think about ways in which we negotiate space 
and how do we reconcile or reclaim these spaces? Or when um, Caroline Renda Williams talked about her body being that of a monument. And then we kind of finished in thinking of notions of living monuments. And so we're thinking of living monuments in mind. I'm going to pull a quote from Du Bois. And the quote is, is ever since I was a child, these songs have these songs have stirred me strangely. They come out of the South unknown to me, one by one, and yet at once I knew them as me and of mine. Then in later years, when I saw I me, mean, when I came to Nashville, I saw the great temple built of these songs towering over the pale city. To me, Jubilee Hall seemed ever made of the bricks, the songs themselves, and its bricks were red with the blood and dust of toil. Out of them rose for me morning, noon, and night, burst of wonderful melody, full of the voices of my brothers and sisters, full of the voices of the past. And so what Du Bois is actually describing is his first experience coming from Great Barrington, Massachusetts to Nashville and seeing the house that is also known as Frozen Music uh, that the Jubilee Singers had built, which today continues to stand as a living monument. The building that I stand in today is actually the house that Du Bois, or sit in today, is actually the house that Du Bois built. Uh, the Carl Van Vechten, Vechten Art Gallery, where we house uh, two exhibition spaces. Uh, du Bois encouraged and gathered the, his class of 1888 to purchase this building. So then it then would become uh, the first gymnasium on an HBCU campus. Uh, he believed that we should be both mentally and physically fit. But today the space is continually activated by the contributions of, of artists from around the world. Now, from the position that we sit today in this space, if you go out to the left, you'll see another building, which is called the Little Theater. Um, the Little Theater is what Ibrahim, uh, the building that we selected that would be wrapped for the intervention. Over the last month, uh, I handled um, the burlap. I'm smiling because I handled it uh, in transporting it from one side of the campus to the other one. Uh, and then over the past month, I witnessed people sewing and stitching carefully uh, the, each individual panel and patching some of the scars and wounds that adorn the fabric or what Bonaventure called the skin of the fabric. And in moving that, I felt the dust. Um, I listened to the conversations. And so it reminded me the same way that Du Bois was describing the history of Jubilee Hall. It gave voice to the material uh, that we were wrapping the building with and gave voice to that building and the histories of that building. And so with that, I'm going to share just a little bit about the history of the Little Theater. That building was originally constructed in 1863 uh, as a Civil War Army barrack. It was located just south of the campus off of 12th Avenue near what is now known as the Gulch. Six months after the Civil War, that building became uh, the Fisk School for I mean, the Fisk Colored Freed School for newly enslaved, newly enslaved people, I mean, newly freed enslaved peoples. Individuals travel hundreds of miles to get an education, which is the ultimate act of, in the pursuit of justice. Now, in 1935, that building came to, uh, was transported from that area to its current location. The current site of Fisk University was what was called uh, prior, well, this current site of Fisk University was Fort Gillum. Fort Gillum uh, was a union fort. It was a contraband camp. And so when you think about the Civil War, that even enslaved peoples, even when they were being emancipated, they were still viewed as a type of property, as contraband, as spoils of war. Uh, but that also bared witness to an opportunity because an opportunity was that the land that held that contraband camp, nobody else wanted. And that became a site for a school that continues uh, to, to provide an avenue or uh, not an avenue, but a, a point of dialogue for the pursuit of justice. So that is kind of where I wanted to encapsulate or begin the conversation. The second part of the question that you kind of asked was really pertaining to uh, the curatorial, what is my curatorial uh, 
prowess or the things that I'm excited about. Um, I stand from a position of advocacy. I think about the contributions of, of artists throughout the diaspora with a hope that we can re-envision or widen the canon, that we can interject these kind of new narratives and bring voices to the people that have, uh, who haven't received the recognition that they truly deserve. And so with that, uh, in this capacity, I also serve as a conduit to bring in and to advocate for more scholarship. I'm gonna stop there for the sake of time to ensure that I'm not gonna go over, um, but I wanted to start there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. Thank you also for bringing the idea of public and justice so entangled. Thank you for speaking so honestly from the grounds of Fisk and giving us, giving us this kind of uh, trajectory of a place, a public living monument and how it continues being enlarged, enlarging and offering possibilities to people. So a monument in constant making in some ways. Uh, you brought us back also to the, to the making of the Ibrahim work that we can come back before presenting his video and the conversations we had when um, we suggested him as part of our program last June, like a year ago from now. I want to go now to Cecilia, who is speaking from New York, who is actually to make a connection right now. They have another work of Ibrahim Mahama up, just up. And also since Cecilia, since you're talking from an institution which is somehow devoted to the public realm and the public sphere, I want to hear from you um, how this is, has been operated, how this has provided some societal, societal changes. Hello. Thank Hello. you for being with us. Thank you so much, Marina, for the introduction. And thank you all for being here. I'm honored to be among such a wonderful uh, group of colleagues. Um, and so today I uh, want to uh, just give you a short presentation of the High Line, uh, which uh, I'm sure you all know, uh, but really kind of looking at some few, like few case studies of projects that we have done uh, hopefully touching upon the issues that Marina um, talked about of publics and communities and uh, and also monumentality. And um, so just very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the High Line, the High Line is a public park. It's uh, built on a old uh, uh, elevated bridge which used to carry trains. It was part of a larger uh, railroad system that was built in the 1930s. Um, the the bridge itself was used until the 80s and then was completely abandoned. And so at the very late, at the very end of the 1990s, a group of community members, actually just two people, uh, got together with the idea of um, saving the highland from demolition because at the time the mayor wanted to demolish it and to turn it into a public space. At that time they had no idea what this public space would be. Uh, but in 2009, finally, after many years of legal battles and advocacy um, and fundraising, the Highland opened as a public park. So what you see in the slide, this beautiful bridge is the Highland. The Highland is a public park. It's owned by the city of New York, but is managed by a private organization, which is Friends of the Highland, which is the organization I work for. And that was the same organization that the community organization that was founded in 1999. Uh, and what, what that means is that it's a classic example of a collaboration between pri private and public, but what it means uh, concretely is also that Friends of the Highland basically raises the funding to maintain and operate this beautiful uh, park. Um, since the Highland opened in 2009, uh, we created a, an art department called Highland Art, and we have been uh, doing different um, arrays of projects uh, throughout the space. Today, I put together a few images um, to, to, to showcase you, to, sh to show you the breadth and the kind of uh, diversity of projects that we've done. Um, I would say that to summarize our goal, um, we 
we want to be able to, if you don't mind, just stop in the slideshow one second, I'll go back to the first one. And um, we want to be able to commission and produce new artworks to um, artists that also have not done necessarily public art. You know, sometimes there is this notion of public art as being this weird thing that magically lands in our plaza in square. Um, we want to do quite the opposite and work also with artists that have never actually um, brought their work to that challenging space, which is the public space. So that's one of like one of the main missions of our program. Also, we uh, want to be able to create connections with the site itself, the Highline, which is, of course is quite unique, but also with the surroundings and with the surroundings being both the city itself, being the Highland, a very urban park, but also with the community that live around the Highland. And finally, um, and I think that's what um, maybe answers Marina's question on how we define public art. I'm interested more in what public art does to us and the idea that public, public art can really generate conversations and discussions among some of today's uh, most relevant topics. And um, so I just want to show you very quickly a few examples and hopefully that will generate some uh, questions. But uh, here on the right, you see one of the very, very first projects we did many years ago by um, artist Ellen Atsui, who covered this abandoned building next to the Highland with this incredible pattern of recycled metal uh, and mirrors. So this was probably uh, one of the biggest pieces we've ever done. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as uh, was this intervention by Daniel Buren, who basically covered uh, half of a mile of the Highland with this kind of um, very iconic flags of his and walking under was almost like walking into, uh, into a living painting in, a, in an open air painting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but at the same time, we, um, we also like to invite artists to really think of the site and what, what it means to work and exhibit in a place like the Highland. So um, I chose this example that is a sculpture by Rashid Johnson because he was really, really, um, Incredible, incredibly careful about um, really respecting the site itself. And so uh, one of the main features of the program is also how uh, the sculptures and installations themselves change throughout the season. So every artwork usually is on view for 12 months, which means that you go from an, in New York City, from New York, from you know very cold winter to very lush summers. Uh, so his piece really integrated the uh, changing of the season. So the work is this sort of minimalist uh, black cubes that is populated by bus made of shea butter. Um, and so here you see the work in April, which is when we install the exhibitions. Next slide, please. Uh, and um, in the next slide, you see how in the summer, the vegetation really is taking over. Next slide, you will see in the fall, there is uh, like trees and, and um, shrubs um, living with the, the, the same piece. And then finally, in the, the next slide, you see the piece uh, in the winter covered with, with snow. Um, and so that's something usually that's uh, it's an element that artists really like to uh, engage with. Uh, but also, next slide, please. Um, We've also worked with artists that um, like also to make fun of what you're supposed to see in public spaces. Uh, this is an artwork by Josh Klein, who kind of played around with the idea of um, the assumptions of what you see in public space. In this case, he brought a vending machine that sometimes you see you know, in our public spaces. Uh, but as you approach it, you realize it actually contains these very fancy smoothies uh, that you see also in health stores uh, around the city. Uh, in a way, he was sort of a um, kind of making fun of New York City's culture, health culture. In fact, those smoothies were actually First of all, you could not actually buy them. It was, there was no place to add money or anything, but also they contained very weird things that you would never actually drink. And it was almost like, um, like a portrait um, of different typologies of New Yorkers that were kind of written on the front of the bottle. Uh, next slide, please. And so I was saying like the Highland is very much, it, 
not an isolated park. It's in the middle of the city. It's built in the middle of the block. Um, so, and it goes from different neighborhoods. It goes from the meatpacking district all the way to Hell's Kitchen. Uh, and it is a very, very popular destination in New York City right now. Well, last year, um, I think the average um, visitorship was around 8 million people. Um, and so, of course, it's narrow, it's elevated, so it's actually also hard to commission new artworks within the park itself. So sometimes we like to expand and really use the city itself as a canvas or as a giant pedestal. So a couple of examples here, we took over a billboard that was a commercial billboard on top of the parking lot and we uh, printed a wonderful piece by Faith Ringgold. Uh, and next slide, please. Also, we have an ongoing series of mural intervention, again, on a wall next to the Highland that is completely kind of empty, no windows that we basically, um, we, that we basically commission artists to paint. Uh, and next slide, please. And also, um, you know, we, we've been able to do also, to bring like live events and performances. This is a very early piece by Trisha Brown, Trisha Brown Company, and the performance itself happened on the rooftop next to the Highland and the audience was uh, sitting on the Highland itself. So again, the ability of creating connections, almost these rhizomatic connections that expand uh, through art, uh, what we can do for the community and with the community. Um, next slide, please. And then, you know, I often get asked if we also do political works, and I think all art is, especially in the public space, does that. It's very, uh, generates a civic uh, discussion, but some pieces were also a bit more overly political. For instance, this is a a uh, wonderful work by Zoe Leonard that you're probably all familiar with. It's called uh, I Want a President. It was a work from the 1990s. It's almost like it's a manifesto that we printed uh, on with paste and hung next to the Highland. It was two, maybe a month or two months before the election in 2016. And so uh, it went from having a very, from gathering lots of hopes for a different future to be uh, of course, uh, torn apart from the, re the result uh, of the election. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And then finally, I just want to mention briefly uh, the very one of the latest projects that we have launched a couple of years ago. It's called the Highland Plint. Uh, next slide, please. The the Highland Plint. The, the Highland Plint is this new. Uh, location on the Highland, in this new space on the Highland, uh, close to Hudson Yards on the north side of the Highland, which is basically the only large scale plaza or piazza that we have on the Highland. Uh, and so we decided that instead of um, designing um, lots of different design or architectural elements, we would put in the middle of the piazza a uh, space where we could commission monumental artworks by artists. We began the project with uh, Brick House, which is a wonderful piece by Simon Lee, uh, but really thinking about the function of art in creating public space. And so uh, it's been really wonderful to see how art has been able to generate a space that is physically, of course, there, but by bringing people together and by not just with the artwork presence, but also by doing uh, many public projects. Pro public um, engagement projects and so forth, it really becomes the focal point of the of the of this part of the Highland. Next slide, please. Um, here you have another view. Next slide, please. And just uh, this is a, a for curiosity, sometimes it takes a long time for us to choose, especially the, the print commission. So we have done a call. These are the 12 finalists for the future edition of the print. If you're curious to learn more, you can uh, check our website, but it's uh, it's been a fun um, experience. And then finally, I want to uh, conclude with, uh, um, with actually Ibrahim because uh, by coincidence, we've been working with Ibrahim for a couple of years maybe even more on a project that we literally just installed uh, two nights ago on the High Line. And the project was supposed to happen last year, um, but we had to pu push it because of COVID. Uh, but the project really began with this image, which uh, the artist took of a, a rusted smokestack uh, um, in a locomotive workshop in Second in Ghana that is now this uh, um, 
tree sprouting from the from its top and it's this very powerful image of the interconnection between uh, human and non-human and human and nature and um, seems a, an image that belonged to the future as well as to the past and uh, Ibrahim was very interested in sort of um, also connecting the history of the uh, British use of railways in Ghana uh, together to the his, to the history of railways on the High Line. So um, we um, went, well, I wasn't there, but he went with my team to North Carolina to scout for, and next slide please, uh, for um, recycled uh, smokestack that we could use. Here you see this incredible place that they visited. Next slide please, um, you see another picture of that. And then finally, next slide, um, the, the piece was supposed to look like this, which is this really beautiful image of an inverted smokestack with a tree sprouting from uh, the top. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that the artwork was installed and uh, just a couple of nights ago um, and has this tree, it's hard to see in the picture, but we'll have a blooming tree on top and in a way celebrates the specific histories of the industrial region of the, of the highland, but also creating these uh, connections. And if you go to the next slide, and this is my last one, uh, the work is called 57 Forms of Liberty. From this perspective on the highland, you can see, of course, Ibrahim's piece, but behind, you can actually see the Statue of Liberty. So for Ibrahim, it was also important to sort of mimic the gesture, gesture of lifting a torch, uh, as you can see both a sculpture and 57 cents for the year that Ghana got um, independence. In. So I hope you'll all be able to come to the Highland and see these works in person. And I look forward to the conversation um, a bit later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for this account. And it's wonderful to discover different sisterhoods. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, all over uh, US and in different manifestations as we got the work from Michigan as well, the University of Michigan. Uh, finally, the work came from them. Also sharing this kind of idea of like presenting the work much earlier than they should because of COVID, but also we have another relations and sisterhood that we, I know that Okwi Okpok Vasili will perform uh, in the closing of Simon's Lee sculpture. And it's another artist that I happened to meet in uh, the Berlin Biennial as Ibrahim in Documenta, so Germany always involved, <laughs> and uh, proposed for the EA DJ program. So she was one of our speakers in the previous fall. And it's wonderful to discover this kind of uh, alliances. Very interesting what you said to us, and we will come back with some questions involving the community, how they react, how they, you know, different comments from the community and all this. But, bef but now I want to move continent and we have to go to UK. And we have to ask Elvira Janganyose to somehow discuss with us about this other location, about the world from another location, as a perspective from every other location is a different perspective <laughs> of the whole world. So, um, my dear Elvira, hello. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, as I say, con everybody's um enthusiasm for sharing the the time and the space with you even if it is in different time zone and so good to see Ibrahim it's been so long <laughs> as well uh and and I remember the first time that uh, we were together in Kumasi uh in the library but I want to start the conversation um that you suggest particularly with this idea around what it means public art in, in the sense of uh, being dispersed in geographies, but also being connected uh, in the precise moment that we were deprived of public space of, or at least the use of public space last, last year, when in different moments, um, the world was in, engaging with lockdowns and confinements. And, and it seemed to me that some, somewhat, somehow we were closer than ever. And I'm not saying necessarily that we were all sharing our screens in internet, but we were closer in this sense of stillness, in this sense of the, the holding pattern, right? You know, in a way that 
um, also notions of the here and they were diluted. So something was happening to all of us. And, and in that respect, we, we engage in a conversation and I want to talk to you, of course, about uh, how that is produced um, from the showroom. Um, but I thought to start with a video. And if you want um, uh, Kira and Mary, um, when it is 30 seconds of the video, you can, you can um, basically mute it. So then I can continue talking. Um, so as I was saying, uh, this is the work, uh, one of the work I have I brought you to uh, of our project, uh, particularly to think about both public space, because this is a, a piece uh, that Colleen Smith did for us, and I will tell you more about it in a minute, uh, but also to think about public sphere, right? Because what it means to intervene, what it means to generate community around art and social justice. Um, and it's also something that we do from the showroom, uh, which for those of you who don't know the organization, it started in the mid eighties as a proposal for artists, as an artist run uh, collective pop-up exhibition that had only um, at that, at the late eighties uh, is first director. And the idea that was always to be a space in which um, the emerging, emerging ideas and practices will come together where collaboration, criticality and learning were integrals to the production of conventional art and discourse, right? And one of the ways that we, uh, I decided and, and for the past uh, 10 years from the location that we are in the area of Paddington, Church Street uh, was to also combine some experimental practices with a reflection uh, upon everyday life, right? Uh, through engagement with local community, but also to advocate um, uh, about the possibility of uh, creating trans in transdisciplinary international forms of art and education. I don't know if you can start with the slides. I had decided, as I was saying, to bring together Two projects, one with, that we did with artist Colleen Smith at the time uh, where we were deprived, as I said, of public space. Um, this is, so what you saw earlier is a video that will play every night during November um, as part of what she called uh, COVID Manifesto, which were these uh, notes uh, that the artist, which is an uh, interdisciplinary artist who think about uh, everyday possibilities of imagination, no? who, who consider through her transdisciplinary background, also the, uh, the role of, of women and womanhood in uh, around issues of care, a care that is uh, sustaining political. And these ideas are some of the ones that we put in, in practice. What is interesting about the manifesto, uh, as you see here, is that throughout, um, uh, you know, when, when the, the, the pandemic hit the US, I mean, we are all, as I said, in this moment where public space is something that we share, no? um, both the, depra the deprivation, but also the articulation in terms of fluidity uh, through the website of such public space. And she found in Instagram a way to uh, develop and, and pass through these notes with her frustration, her reflections and inspirations of uneventful episodes of real life, but also uh, news and, and things that were connecting with some of, of the aspects that we were living as, you know, the uh, manage, the central government in the US management of the pandemic, or as you have pointed out so beautifully, uh, Magda, uh, the assassination of George Floyd. What, are, what were the collective actions uh, and the idea of the claim of police brutality, uh, the, the sense that we couldn't go back to a normal life just be, after this period in that perhaps no? as, as um, uh, uh, Arendetta Roy, like the writer was saying, no, we were all uh, suspended in this portal and we needed to think 
uh, how we could resolve that uh, in a different way. There is something very interesting uh, in what uh, Colleen suggests us to do in occupying, so the, the videos as you saw earlier were presented in one of the most important public squares in London, no? uh, Piccadilly Circus, which is of course, as in the case of the High Life, an incredible touristic location. I couldn't even imagine how many people uh, pass by every day. And at the same time that we were opening uh, that show, one of the most incredible thing happened and is that the uh, women in Poland were uh, protesting and, and, and there were set a series of demonstrations in the city uh, of London and other cities in Europe that were uh, of course um, uh, replicating such protests. And that was happening uh, in Piccadilly Circus at the time that we were launching the project. Uh, you have seen also some of the um, uh, pages of the website of Circa, our colleagues and collaborators for, for this initiative. In fact, Circa runs um, uh, this interruption of one of the largest uh, public spacing uh, um, uh, screens, no? 4K screens in Europe. Here, for instance, you see the website and you have access to all the material. And for a month, we were not only presenting the work of the artist and, and this sort of like reinvention of, of her notes in which, as you saw, as a, almost like an, a living still life, she will have in her desk a tableau in which other elements of her career, her preoccupation, her aesthetics will come to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the table, no? in, 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 the, in the literal uh, sense of the word. But also we will bring some of the, her previous projects. One of the things that interests me about this, which connect with the second project that I bring for you is this examination of the consequences of sociopolitical, economic and cultural uh, disparities, right? Uh, that were um, also, for instance, issues of mismanagement, right? How we hold accountable our institutions, right? The, the intervention in, in, in the, of public art is not only in terms of public physical space, but also public sphere, no? The sense of publicness. And, and one thing that for me was, critically in inviting uh, with my team, uh, Colleen, uh, to work with us is this sense of the humanness that she expressed in those notes, how we could bring that to one of the uh, the, the screens in, in, in Piccadilly Circus that normally is populated by publicity, by, you know, like uh, uh, the, the most, in, the, the, I don't know, like you can imagine like all the brands that are part of the, uh, the capitalist exercise that we all confront every day. So that intervention somehow resonates vividly with some of the aspect that uh, then the next project uh, that you were starting seeing, and, and please, Mary, launch the images as you go, uh, which was the, the project that Navin Candosos developed with us in between June and July uh, 2019 in which using this sentence that uh, made uh, famous, um, uh, the unfamous sentence by uh, Margaret Thatcher, no, there is no alternative, um, used to consider what will be the alternative to prevent, no? and how issues around, for instance, current issues around the Kill the Bill movement, which has to do with the proposed changes to the police crime and sentences, sentencing and core bills uh, appeal uh, that is uh, now in parliament, but also with the, the racial disparity that recent report have established and uh, with this uh, very polemic commission of race and ethnic disparities uh, report. No? So we, we, uh, we so, so both artists for me bring us the possibility to in very different terrain, one in public space, the other in the intimacy of our space, which is the space that you are seeing now, we could engage with the possibility of holding authorities and, and the moment accountable, right? And, and, and so the, the project of, of Navin Candoso was directed to um, reflect on a research that she has done, but also on a collective re uh, research parallel to uh, the government um, um, uh, prevent guidance, but also uh, 
uh, independent uh, review of that guidance that was approved in 2015 uh, by the, the parliament in the United Kingdom uh, as part of the country's counterterrorism and security act. And, and, and it talks about how one can establish duty of care at the national level. Things that are extremely complex that I'm trying to bring here, but, but I thought that was important also to, to talk about how, for instance, um, what was happening after September 11 in the US affected uh, notions and the, the US declaration of war and terror, the, the so-called end of the post-war, and the imminent uh, increase of security, surveillance, and some of the things that, that we see now in the status quo. This offer as something that could uh, create a sense of uh, care that provide a care at the national level, right? Uh, but also that presents legal failures, misunderstanding, and, and sometimes affect specific communities. Some of the things that we did through the workshops and also through the presentations in the space, this is, as you see, is an archive that could be used that uh, offer the public a space for memorabilia to uh, engage with, as she was doing, um, using the, the logos uh, that, um, just to clarify, no, uh, the prevent duty doesn't have a visual representation. And this was the main key uh, element that Naveen Candosas uses to engage with it. So when you see these images, this is a durational piece that I started with a series of logos reinvented by the artists to uh, create these questions about the possibility of us coming together to collectively think of an alternative to some guidance such as prevent. Uh, and, and, and then it also was, a, a, a key uh, question to say, well, when we are talking about public understanding of care, public understanding of security, public understanding of community, who is included in that uh, reflection and who is left out? No? What are the representational narrative uh, of that uh, sense of unity? How, how are they formulated, formulated, right? Who are the voices that are unheard and where and those silences uh, became uh, or can affect uh, public policies, right? Like what are those silences and how that affect uh, the formulation of public policy? Perhaps the last thing that I will say is that in making that reflection and transition about how we can be relevant as an institution, the key thing was also to to situate ourselves beyond the status quo, beyond the official down, to to anticipate, but also to engage with possibilities of being misunderstood in our intentions, right? Uh, because we have seen that, no? because we didn't want to speak on behalf of the other, but we could also be seen as the one speaking on behalf of the main structure. So the, the possibility of engaging with that, challenging that was critical to us. And, and perhaps the last point of this project, which is the point that we are now, and I invite you to uh, go to our website, download the book, and contest um, some of the narrative that we present there or go with them, uh, is to offer the public the possibility to respond to some of the queries that we made in the, in the project, but also that are reflected in the dialogue that several participants uh, um, have in the in the have made throughout the conversation uh, in the space, but also during the time uh, now in the in the new di dialogues in the book. And I realize that there are many things that I haven't explained about prevent and surveillance, but we can uh, take that on the on the question and answer if if that uh, is something that interests to the public. Our audience now. <laughs> Elvira, thank you so much for bringing these two great um, works by these two women artists in our conversations, two very site-specific, location-specific, condition-specific works that really make sense of the public sphere and also enlarging the public sphere in the internet uh, on some ways. 
uh, also taking it out in instances, it's a totally different thing to see a film in your screen alone and to see it together with other people in Piccadilly Square, even if you have the chance to see it alone. So thank you so much for giving us this point and we'll come back with questions about care, abscesses and prep presences, public sphere. And with these absences and pre presences, I want to go to our next speaker, uh, Paul C. Taylor, and who, and also go into that specific uh, part where you refer to your book, Black is Beautiful, a philosophy of black aesthetic and race. As a uh, And uh, uh, I, you refer to this kind of absences or the neglect of some, um, let's say, uh, black aesthetics that they've been formulated and spoken about through various movements within the history of cultural aesthetics and how these are not like the negritude and other movements and how these are not apparent uh, within the, let's say, more uh, dominant uh, philosophy of the art. You also somehow, um, I read that you were saying that uh, you bring forward the role of expressive practices in creating and maintaining black life worlds in the context of white supremacy. And this was very interesting point for me, uh, if you can bring it forward in, in relation to the public uh, spheres and the publics who are the publics and to what we've been discussing so far. Thank you for being here with us. It is my great pleasure to be here. I will do my very best to uh, carry the burden that you have, uh, the, the blissful burden you have laid upon me. Uh, it is a, a great honor and a privilege to be a part of this wonderful company. I am extraordinarily grateful to my colleague, Professor Campos Pons for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. This is rich and edifying and wonderful, and I'm really thrilled to be here and thrilled to uh, anticipate the conversation that we will soon have. Uh, so we've been convened under the heading of a conversation about public art and dispersed geographies. We've been invited to think about what it means to live together in precarious Souths. Uh, I'm excited to think about these things with all of you. Sadly, however, I have nothing to show you I am not an artist, I'm not a curator. My practice is words and ideas and words and ideas mobilized not in the manner of our great conceptual artists, but in the manner of a dude who sits in his room and writes things down on paper. So I have nothing to show you. I will invite you to uh, bear with me as I work through a single thought with you, a single simple thought, I think, that has a handful of features that are worth our attention. Uh, the thought I want to think through with you has to do with achieving the public. I want to talk to you about achieving the public. I'm interested in thinking about this because it takes work to make publics. Publics are things we have to build and sustain and achieve and tear down when they don't do the work we want them to do. Publics are achievements. Race often complicates the work of achieving our publics. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it complicates. And art often complicates the work of achieving the publics we want, but it can advance the project of achieving the publics to which we aspire. So I wanna think with you a little bit about achieving the public, about what public means, about how race gets involved in our publics and how art gets involved in our publics. A few simple thoughts. So first, what do I mean by the public? I don't mean the thing that social influencers, influencers aspire to inhabit and distort and mobilize and, and monetize. I mean the condition of social life that refuses the private, the insular, the personal and the parochial. I mean those forms of social arrangements, those ways of living together that involve joint participation and shared enterprises. I mean, in particular, those modes of social arrangement that recognize rights of access, rights of voice, rights of presence, right? Publics are made up of people who recognize each other as shared participants or as participants in a shared enterprise. You don't enter the public just when you leave your house, right? Publics require certain kinds and conditions to exist. 
So that's what I mean by the public. There are a number of philosophers who, and other people who've thought uh, interesting, important thoughts about this. I will spare you the chapter and verse. I will instead uh, try to operationalize this to some degree by building on a thought that many of us have introduced already into this conversation. Those of us who follow politics in the US, many of us are thinking about George Floyd today. We're thinking about it for straightforward reasons. We're thinking about uh, the case of George Floyd's killer that was brought to fruition or to completion yesterday. One way to think about some of what happened in that situation is as a contest over the public. Right? What it is to be a police officer is to have control over who has rights of voice, who has rights of presence, who can be where, who belongs where, whose testimony counts, what the public is, what the boundaries of the public are, who is outside of it, right? Derek Chauvin thought George Floyd was not in public when he had his knee on George Floyd's neck. But the observers, the bystanders who filmed what was happening to George Floyd contested that conception of the public. They constituted a public in that moment by their action. Publics are achievements and they take work. So that's my first part of this thought. Uh, that's what I mean by the public. What does race have to do with this? Well, as I say, race often complicates the work of achieving our publics. Sometimes it helps, but it often complicates, right? One of the reasons it complicates is that race in many ways works as a kind of circuit breaker, right? I'll tell you what I mean. We're used to thinking about race in terms of racism, we're used to thinking about the damaging features of race in terms of overt racism, things people do to each other in the name of hateful ideologies and so forth. But as we all know, there are many more insidious and subtle ways in which race does its work. Some of those ways involve what I'm calling working as a circuit break, right? Race invites us certain kinds of racial ideologies, that is to say, invite us not to know things we ought to know, not to know things we could know, not to feel things we could feel, not to see things we should see. This is the spirit in which James Baldwin in the 60s wrote famously in The Fire Next Time. There is a kind of innocence that pervades American society in the grip of which there are things people don't know about what they're doing to other people. And there are things they don't want to know. And so they can insulate themselves from this damaging and dangerous knowledge and persist in the sense of themselves as innocent and pure, right? Moral agents, right? So one of the things race in its negative formulations does is it short circuits the processes by which we might other might know things we should know, might feel things we should feel, including the humanity of the other people who might join us in the shared projects of our publics. Right? So we know what publics are, we know how race involves itself in this work of building publics, of complicating the work of building publics. Race also, of course, can be an illuminator as well as a circuit breaker. It can help us identify the shared conditions under which we might recognize each other as shared participants in an enterprise, perhaps an anti-racist enterprise, an anti-colonial or decolonial enterprise, right? So race can work in different ways, right? Which in some ways is where art comes in. And this is the last part of the thought I wanted to work through with you. I will close very soon. One of the things art does for us is it builds publics. It does this in part because it presupposes publics. Artworks are made for audiences and communities. Artworks mobilize shared intuitions about how certain materials work, how certain messages and symbols and signs function and ought to function, right? Art presupposes these publics. Public art explicitly attempts to identify and mobilize these publics or to excavate the shared conditions under which publics might recognize themselves, right? Art is central to the work of building, mobilizing, sustaining publics. And public art aims squarely at this work and public art in racialized settings aim squarely at this work in extraordinarily or can aim squarely at this work in extraordinarily powerful ways. I've thought most recently about the great work of Sonia Clark and her monumental piece. Think about the work, of course, of Mr. Mahama and his important installations, right? But public art in racialized settings takes explicitly on itself the burden of identifying the conditions under which publics might, become into being, might come into being, the challenges that the members of these potential publics face, right? And the shared conditions 
in virtue of which it might behoove us to recognize each other as members of shared projects. So let me bring this to a close by turning back to a figure a couple of us have mentioned, I think in this context of W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois said in his great address in 1926, Criteria of Negro Art, all art is propaganda and ever must be. This is a complicated claim. He unpacks it in a complicated piece. Here's one of the things he meant. If you are an artist, if you seek to mobilize and manipulate materials to express meanings, you are presupposing some things. You are presupposing some currents of meaning that mobilize or that circulate in communities and signify things in ways that you can't control all the time, right? So you have a choice as an artist. Your choice is how do you ride the currents of those meanings? All art is propaganda. The question is whether it's good or bad propaganda, right? So I'll close with this thought and with another quotation. The great Lewis Gordon reminds us in his first book, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, that John Paul Sartre in his Rome lectures reminded his listener that the colonizer is a moral agent too. That is to say, Publics are moral projects, different publics have different moral purposes. So the question for people who want to inhabit, mobilize, sustain, build publics is what kind of public are you aspiring to? To whom will you appeal with this public, right? These are the questions that come to mind for me when I think about publics and public art. And these are the questions I'm eager to think with you about as the conversation continues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, for, uh, Paul, for that kind of very, for contextualizing many parts we've been discussing previous to your thesis, and also for adding this idea of achieving the public, which was extremely important. Uh, it's extremely important for us as curators as well, because often we are there to answer in different applications. Who are your public? How many? Why? Because that's how money translates, funding translates in this, which is actually, a crime because achieving the public, being with the public, making a public, opening up a public is often what we should do and not presuppose who our public will be. So thank you so much for bringing it from a more philosophical, of course, point of view. And also thank you so much for taking this position of, uh, let's say the racial discussion um, and somehow undoing the binaries and bringing us to this kind of in-between position of you know, either ors. You said also, you, you cite this beautiful quote uh, from W. E. Du Bois about the art as propaganda that brings, that makes a great pass to Ibrahim Mahama because just a few hours ago, we were discussing about what he does and about artists of his generations that somehow through the work, move out from the symbolic uh, nature of art to a kind of a more pragmatic action. Like their art stopped being just a symbolic exercise. I know, I mean, I heard him just before, so I don't want to speak in his, on his uh, turn, but it was a great uh, unforeseen bridge that you make to our next speaker, Ibrahim Mahama, that will speak about that then, and also about his work who's about to uh, open tomorrow uh, in Nashville, on the grounds of Nashville uh, in Fisk University. And it was important for us to have an art intervention among two others in the location, even if we speak on the cloud, speaking of public sphere. So Ibrahim, can you... Uh, Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Marina. And hi, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having me. It's such an honor to be speaking among great uh, intellectuals and uh, art professionals. Um, I've known some of you for quite a while. I met Elvira when I was in art school, actually, <laughs> so many years ago when she came to Ghana. And Chichilia, whom I've worked with and known for a while, we've been trying to do the Highline project for quite a long time. but. Uh, I'm glad that at least in, um, in the COVID, post-COVID world, we still managed to get this done. Uh, yeah, I've been in conversation with uh, Jamal and Magda and Marina regarding this project for a while. And I'm glad that actually we're able to do it because there's always a question of when to do something and if there is a right time, but I guess there isn't any specific right time. 
Um, so just to jump in, yeah, the question of public art has always been very central to my work. Um, I guess in the beginning, when I was in art school, I was more con the, con the question from our professors uh, were more how artists could somehow move away from traditional art making and practices into going into the city, uh, looking into the failures and precarity and trying to learn from it and see ways in which artists could produce work that could somehow uh, turn, uh, lead towards social justice and also propose new ideas of aesthetics and new ideas of social relations. Maybe through the work that an artist uh, proposes, society might, re might change its uh, perceptions or its ways of organization. So myself, I started using residues of materials, older materials like the jute sacks and many other objects in creating uh, works that somehow could allow audiences, like whether they were, whether they knew what art was or what art wasn't, to somehow to engage them in some kind of a public conversation. And uh, I started with a series called the Occupation Series. And in that Occupation Series, I did a couple of projects, including uh, architectural structures, uh, bridges, um, uh, market spaces, commodities in like public spaces and all that, including uh, silos and other spaces. Uh, but later on, I later, much later in my practice, I realized that there was something beginning to happen in my work. I was beginning to be more interested also in those public spaces, like the architecture and those spaces, the skeletons that the work, the, the, the symbolic work, which is what is jute sacks, what somehow covering. Though it did something as an artwork, I thought there was more to it. In the project I did with the Highline with Chichilia, I was uh, traveling around these spaces in the country, some of the older historical spaces, like the railway infrastructure, which was built by the British in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and collecting archives and memories, residues of things from there for these institutions I was building as a thing, as a project, artistic project. But I was also interested in how these objects could reflect upon, let's say, contemporary or modern spaces or things like that. So um, the project in the Highline was as a result of uh, trying to learn from existing, uh, some of these existing spaces. I will turn my camera to show you a space that I was with Marina this morning. So some of these, so this space, for instance, you see is a, a modernist building, which was built by Eastern European architect in Ghana. It was one of more than 200 projects that was built at the time because our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, who also worked closely with the boys, was very much interested in this idea of like uh, economic independence in relation to the African continent. So he worked with Eastern European architects at the time of the Cold War to construct these spaces where grains would be stored in. So for instance, in this uh, building, you have a space like this, which is an architectural detail, which norm or like if the, if the space had been completed, you would have, they would have been pouring, for instance, cocoa or share nut into it, which machines would have pumped into the building. But because it was never completed, it almost became like a pond. So uh, we, 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 we reworked it and then actually we kept fishes and toads and other uh, uh, amphibians that were actually living within the space. In the 60s, the building was uh, somehow abandoned. Uh, after Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown. So it was completely abandoned. So all these details that you see were things that interventions that were done by the state and uh, just to prevent people from um, going into, falling into the building because they didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, so, yeah. So when I, last year during the lockdown, the government was proposing to sell the building because like many of these buildings, they've never really been worked out and they've all been privatized. So I asked myself the question because I've used my, the capital for my work over the last six, seven years actually to build these two institutions in Tamale, which is SCCA Tamale and Red Clay, actually towards rethinking about what art is like doing retrospectives and things like that. So the idea was somehow to also allow these spaces to inspire me as an artist to go back in time and to propose the acquisition of some of these spaces which would have ordinarily been destroyed 
um, so uh, buying these spaces and then like as a private individual, but then uh, turning it into a public space. Because when I bought this space, uh, I bought it under a public trust, which I created. So working with like collaborators and um, construction teams, uh, the artistic director at the center, SECA Salam Kuji, and my colleagues from the university, we're able to restore these spaces. Interestingly enough, this test that you're seeing is um, from Second D, the same place which inspired the work on the High Line, 57 Forms of Liberty. And when the place was being renovated, they were taking these parts of the building out and destroying them. And I did a work in Manchester last year, the Parliament of Ghosts, and a lot of the materials from the Parliament was actually from there. But I brought this there here. Because I didn't, I wanted to save it, but I didn't know what acquired the building. Two years later, when I acquired the building, it was covered in uh, water. We realized that there was a gap between accessing a very major part of the building. And I said to myself, there is this old stairs that I took, maybe it fits here. And we brought the stairs, and interestingly enough, it was almost as if it was meant for it. But this stairs was made more than 50 years before this building was built. And the stairs was actually built within a colonial time, but the building was built in the height of our independence and thinking about ways in which we could escape that colonialism. So there are a lot of questions that kept coming back into mind about the artists uh, making work that somehow allows the public to somehow rethink about ways in which they can take responsibility, at least within this generation, with all the failures and precarity that we've witnessed and how we can somehow maybe use spaces like this or the work that I'm doing as almost, almost some kind of a time machine to be able to allow us to access time in a very different way. Because by coming into this space, there are questions or conversations that the public suddenly are coming to. Because uh, but for more than 60 years, a space like this, which was public, was completely hidden. And suddenly, there is, uh, uh, suddenly it's, it's possible because of artistic intervention. And uh, uh, the danger is that in doing things like this, sometimes the artist might think that, OK, maybe he, uh, in relying on private capital in order to make interventions like this, it can almost suddenly be misguided or mis uh, corrupted. But I think that it's very important that at least if we allow the, if we allow this, uh, all the, all the, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, like all the crisis that is within our time to inspire us, we can somehow re uh, go back to the question of life, which we have been talking about. I think to end it, the most important thing in this building, which I, which has been very important to me, has been microorganisms. Um, has been microorganisms, uh, fishes, boats, bats, owls, snakes. Because when I bought the building for more than 50 years since it wasn't used, there were living things in it, bats and all that. So one of the most important things was somehow to borrow the spirit and elements of architecture to redesign the space in such a way that we could cohabitate or co-share the space. Because I think one of the things that the, the coronavirus uh, teaches us is about the question of life itself. And also with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, killing of George Floyd and everything in the last one year or more, which has somehow amplified the much more greater reason why we should be much more uh, empathetic so towards uh, life, if not just human life, but also thinking about the greater environment in general and how maybe mankind can look beyond itself into preserving the planet for what it is. So that's, yeah. Thank you so much, Ibrahim, for making us, for making this tour and for explaining some basics of this work and how you moved from the symbolic uh, nature of art per se, or of art as we know it, to a kind of a more pragmatic um, 
activity that interferes the public sphere uh, just for the sake of the audience and we come back with the questions to say that uh, you already with the capital from your artwork somehow built uh, a school uh, an institution as a museum, a school which is part of your studio, this institution now that, and you allowed the restitution of modern artworks as well as more ancient works that will come from museums that they've been captive from, that they've been exhorted. So this is an amazing to think and amazing to think that your occupational, your occupation series the living monument that we're going to host now in Fisk University in Nashville is also a living currency. A living currency because somehow through this you channel, let's say, funds back to the community. And this is where the non-corruption comes. It's extremely interesting to think and it brings us back to last June that uh, when the whole conversation around Confederate monuments was live and when we're discussing with EADJ about how our program will be formulated, so effortlessly came to my mind to propose your work for the main reason of questioning the monument, not only to as a monumental work, but as a work that questions what the monument should be and could do in the public sphere. So thank you so much for accepting for everything. And with this, I want to let finally the discussion start. It's been amazing presentations and go back to Jamal uh, as where we started. Uh, if you want, um, as, as you were brief and in the beginning to comment farther the responsibility you undertake of undertaking of being in such an important, let's say, um, position in the Fisk University by being a curator of the Fisk art galleries and communicating parts of the university to the publics, also achieving publics, as Paul very well uh, spoken about and um, how do you see the future the present and the future mm. uh, in always connection with the past of the university right now within the current discussion so i'm going to go back thank you for for the question and it's something that we kind of grapple with all the time and that's really shifting the gaze and i spoke briefly about widening the canon and so what we you know just to talk about fisk just a little bit or at least the galleries and even the institution is one of the largest report repositories of cultural production of people of color throughout the diaspora. And so on one side, you know, we also like to talk about the exchange or this perennial conversation. Um, uh, Paul C. Taylor is actually working on an essay for upcoming uh, publication that's with an exhibition that speaks to that. And that exhibition that's coming up in the fall of 2022 is African Modernism in America. And so that's looking at, um, it stems from an exhibition that was put on by the Harmon Foundation, but it really speaks to the exchange between African and African-American artists and really kind of bridging that gap. And then also it brings in to focus this kind of lens of the, the, how we've participated in this process. And so I think about Aaron Douglas who looked back to the continent for source information, but also went to the continent um, and, and develop relationships and, and, and with statesmen and other scholars and other artists. And also David Driscoll, who went several times. And then Charles S. Johnson, who was the first African-American president of Fisk and a sociologist by trade, attempted to influence policy, uh, both home and abroad. And so that kind of forms the, 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 the ground of, of kind of the perspective that I kind of think about. One is the exchange, but the other aspect of it is facilitating access. And that's the thing that I find um, most near and dear to, to, our, to, to my heart. And that's the point that we, we stand from. And so to answer that question, I'm trying to think about the best way to answer that question without going into a long uh, dialogue because I can be long-winded at times. But the first thing that we want to do is to expose students to these critical thinkers. The second thing that we attempt to do is to, is to train and develop the next generation of artists, not just artists, but future leaders. And so with that, we have a whole host of programs to do so. Um, we always think about how can we change the field and broaden the narrative? Well, we have to equip the young people with the tools 
and the opportunity to make space and the ability for us to make space for them to interject into the conversation and push the field forward. And so thinking about the question that you ask is what do I envision for the future? What I envision for the future is that we have a more collective narrative, that we have a broader narrative, that we can speak to the contributions with the hope of having a better understanding of the world that we live in. As what Dr. Taylor had talked about earlier in terms of public and what public means um, and what we, and, I, and I'm gonna paraphrase him just a little bit, but what we hope to aspire to be. And so I think that through art and through what we describe as e EADJ, which is the vehicle in the pursuit of that, that we can make a, better, a much inclusive and a much better world. And so that is what my hope is for the future. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, you did, definitely so. Thank you so much, Jamal. And um, of course, you leave us with ideas, you know, the head now is spinning of how the future could be. And please, anyone in the floor, if you want to intervene and, and like make your own questions too, I would want to go to Cecilia now and somehow um, speaking of future, speaking of achieving publics, to get a little bit more of your relation to your own public uh, around the Highline art, and also to ask what to through this to, inter to intervene a question that we received from Magda Campbell Spawn students, and to ask if you think that the location of the artwork can change the meaning of the engagement for the viewers if the actual location changes meaning. Cecilia. Also to this before, actually before to give you the floor, I wanted to ask you since right now you are the artistic director of, of one of the largest uh, gatherings of contemporary art to be Venice Art Biennial, uh, I wanted to ask you if you have a certain public that now that you're building the show, if you have a certain public to our mind, to your mind while building your exhibition. But let's start from Highline. Yeah, and I think in a way uh, there are lots of similarities when it comes to talking about public both at the Highline and in Venice because they're both fairly large uh, um, events and they really talk to very broad public. And you know, the, the question of the public is always uh, very fascinating for me because the Highland sometimes is in this paradoxical situation in which we have a huge amount of public already. You know, we have around 8 million people that come to the Highland. And so it's, it's almost like you have to undo that public and, and section it off to understand who that is. And so it's very hard for me to discuss the public because of, as you can all imagine is so diverse and so so I think you know the way I always like to think of the public and in a way also uh, you know the community that we want to reach is very much um, like a series of rings you know that they contain each other and I think to me as a public art commissioner my audience and my public is the artists and I want to be able to serve them and to you know, to make sure that as a, as a curator, I can bring their work to the broader publics in, 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 in a great way, but always thinking as the, the artistic community, as the first community I want to reach. And then out of that, you know, it expands, of course, the Highland is also in a very specific location within the city, it's in Chelsea. So there is the Chelsea Art uh, District, which is the biggest art district and so I always keep that in mind because uh, that's also the people that like the expert that come, but at the same time, uh, being a linear park that covers one and a half miles of our city, you know, we cross so many different communities and publics. So it goes from, you know, people that have been living here for decades and many people were like living in community housing. And, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you have Hudson Yards, which is this new mega development um, that was just built in the last couple of years. And so how do you balance off uh, these public? And I think, you know, I, we try, of course, to be respectful and meaningful for all, but uh, we, we also aim at sh and shaping public programs and community engagements and live events for very, very, very small portions of the community surrounding us. And, you know, in the great scale of, of scope of things, you know, you might not necessarily notice the effect, but 
for us as a, as a, as a public park that is rooted within the community here, it's very important to really uh, work with specific communities in our neighborhood. Um, on the Venice Biennale on the other side, you know, it's uh, it in a way has the same contradiction. You have, um, it's an event that is mainly visited by our world professional, but then it's a show that lasts for seven months. And Ibrahim knows very well, having participated a few times, that um, it's um, besides or beyond, you know, the excitement or the nightmare of the kind of opening week, it, it, there is a possibility of creating so many different forms of engagement with the city of Venice and with the students of the amazing universities in Venice uh, and with the people that live there. And so sometimes as international visitors, we might not know that that exists, uh, but especially as an um, Italian curator, uh, I feel that tremendous responsibility. I was also thinking of the exhibition as a, as not just something that magically drops into Venice uh, and then everyone has to deal with it, but to try and create bridges and connections. It, it, it's hard. And also like, you know, I'm speaking as though we were still in 2019. <laughs> so now everything is different. You know, the Highland does not receive 8 million visitors. The Venice Finale is not gonna have 700,000 and numbers don't really matter. But so I think this is actually an opportunity to sort of go back to zero and really be much more uh, meaningful and intentional in the communities and publics that we want to achieve. And then the question about the location, yeah, I think so. I think it, it does change. I don't know if it changes the meaning, but it changes definitely the use or the fruition of the artwork. And I think, you know, it's, that's why it's important to working on the high line with an artist is a long process. You know, we always start with a walk. And so I don't necessarily tell an artist, oh, I want your piece here. Uh, and Ibrahim can, like, knows that very well. You know, I might have an idea and they come and they have the opposite idea. So it's really about you know, thinking about the interconnection between the site and the artworks and the, and the way people experience that, um, that piece. But it, there's also something about public art that I think is also, it's magic that you try to control everything possibly uh, that could possibly happen, but there is always something that will surprise you, you know, no matter how much you're doing brainstorming and, and you try to, to oversee everything. As soon as the show opens, the publics and the communities and the visitors, we just use it in different ways. So, but that's, that's the beauty of it. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. And this is also going again to Paul's point about achieving the public. The public now interferes and somehow formulates the work together in the public with all the, the artists, the organizers. And Ibrahim Mahama also knows this because, I mean, the occupational series is, uh, the occupation series is works that they've been done collectively to that form. There, it is also a, a living monument. But uh, speaking on this somehow, um, let's say, uh, the small changes between the local community, the broader community, which I totally empathize uh, after the experience of Documenta and having seen how it was in Athens during the opening, like a huge, and how it was before and after, because it continued to operate with communities. Um, it's true that it's a different, different uh, uh, engagement. And I wanted to go now to Elvira and also bring a kind of a question from uh, our students, from the students of Magda. And that says, do you think it could be more beneficial to display artwork in smaller, more local setting rather than large scale museums? Do you think it creates a more personal connection to the viewer? That's one part, but to enlarge this question, I wanted also that you somehow discuss with us uh, this experience with Colin Simmons and other works that they, they are from within the space, outside the Piccadilly and vice versa. And all this. Uh, and well, I mean, uh, no, thank you for that. I mean, I, I want to try to respond to this uh, and at the same time picking on something that Paul was talking about in relation to achieving uh, the public because one of the things that we try to generate also, or at least I like to think about exhibition making as such proposition, which is to generate organic communities, right? Like 
one of the advantages that the showroom has is that it has been for the past 12 years in the same location that creates relationship with the neighbors in a way that are also emphasized in the kind of program that I have projected, but also that my uh, colleagues, Luis Shelley, and particularly the, direct, the former director, Emily Pethy, did with communal knowledge project. And that also tells you about what makes relevance the institution in the space. No, it's not only the generation of a cultural program, it's also how that somehow intertwined with everyday life, with the connection with the people uh, that live in the neighborhood. And, and it makes you think about what it will mean to disappear from that space, what it will mean for them and for us as, a, as an organization. So the idea of being relevant and, and generate the community as we develop project is, is very important. Another issue for me that is also critical is how context determine, uh, and that could perhaps be the response to the small place versus the larger place. I think I have been advocating for a few years now, the idea of the slow consumption. And, and in a way, uh, the, the, the COVID provokes that, right? Like there are less people in the museum. No, when I was told that, MoMA can only upset a hundred people. I'm like, whoa, let me fly to New York because all of a sudden we, we, will, we will be prompted to a different relationship with the space. Most of that though has also to do with us. We decide how, how long we can, we can linger our gaze onto a work, right? And, and how that we engage with the work in such a way. So I, there was something that somebody said that I thought, oh, yes, there are, uh, the sort of the result of the of the of the R, but also I thought there is something about the experience, right? And and we dictate our experience uh, with our works. We decide. Um, there is this beautiful quote by uh, the philosopher uh, Maria Jose Monsian that says, uh, uh, "Let me see if I can uh, find it." Something extremely beautiful that I that I used to think about uh, Navin's work, but but then in a way that can be think in relation to any word or any image, for instance, no? because she is somebody that talks about the homo spectator and, and talks about the power and the authority of images. And she, she says, on what condition does a spectator suspend her, her action to sit in a room? It is an abuse of power if the power of the author is not shared, right? And I feel like there is something about what Ibrahim, you have been doing, no? like in sharing the power which in a way, like it, 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 it comes this sense with the capital, but it's also about sharing your platform of visibility, sharing your condition of the stories um, to, a, to a way in which also to, to follow what you were saying also, Paul, that, or I don't know who, who says it, maybe Jamal, something you said also from me, to think about uh, the making of the community because the audiences sometimes are these passerby, right? Like some people that, will go see the monument and leave, will go see the park once and leave, or people that will go over and over to New York to spend time in the high line. But, but so, so to me, that sense of the organic community that the people that is drawn to a space um, due to propaganda or no one had to see. But there, there is also this idea of how the artists um, and, and I was thinking also in something you say, Jamal, about the notion of the conduit, right? Like the, us being the vehicle for something else, curators, artists, uh, educators, right? Like we, we are conduits or something else. But particularly I was thinking in the artists and the possibility not only to, and, and this is a sentence that unfortunately I never, I, I didn't write myself, but I, it's uh, from a, a theorist, uh, that is really known to me, um, Jaisa Hernandez, who will say that artists uh, um, are better equipped than historians to tell things the way, uh, not the way they happen, but the way they felt. No? And I feel that this, this sense of the achieving, uh, 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 achieving uh, public has to do also with uh, the possibility of expressing how we feel, right? Like the engagement of, of, of how we feel. And that also, of course, has to do with the, the idea of bear witness, which is also something about, you know, that we have, we, we have encountered, you know? uh, Ronnie Keynes uh, was one of the first moments of, oh, I mean, we, the, unfortunately we have in the history 
uh, many, many occasions in which we have observed the death of others in our own eyes. We bear witness to that. Now it's the, the equipment of us to, to become a storyteller, to become narrators, to become agents of caring in that sense, is that sense of bearing witness, no? which is what we all did uh, dramatically when we, when we, because of these neighbors, uh, attended the murder of um, the assassination of, of um, Floyd. No? So there is something about that sense of how we are brought together to the experience that make us feel in a certain way. Uh, to the world that make, I, I love me, experience museums of my own as well. Like I love to go through the idea of this is slow consumption, the, the idea of being in a space with a work as we will engage with perhaps, you know, architecture no? in a way that uh, that is about the experience, not only the perception of the world through our gaze, it's also an embodying uh, perception of the world. No? So I feel like, I don't know if I responded, but this is sort of my take on, on some of the things that, we have been discussing. Um, Marina, I don't know if you asked me so I completely lost uh, my, my uh, train of thought, so I don't know if you... <laughs> no, no, I mean, it was part of uh, what I asked you and I see that we have also many, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, in, the, in the public that came unfortunately last uh, minute. So I will pass to all of you to considering them, but I don't know if we can address them. Uh, it was interesting to hear you speaking on the slow consumption and particularly um, because it's something we all share in the arts, how important it was. On the other hand, of course, uh, many people have been hit severely in the art uh, because they can't really survive economically as many people uh, in the independent, let's say, realm of the arts, artists or curator were being paid from projects or others were relaying in the restaurant business and all of these are closed. So there are many things to think about. And when I hear slow consumption, my mind goes also to the fast production and the, uh, the workers that have to be producing and producing and producing with all the risk, even during the pandemic time, production never became slow. And there were so, so many people from workers in these companies that got sick and uh, but they, they kept the world moving so it's it's a very ambivalent uh, i'm totally with you in the slow consumption i don't know how this would propagate towards the general production and the capitalism sort of sphere um i wanted to ask paul because he's the only one that i didn't go back for a question if you want to add something into this before we move forward to magda and then to the video of the making of of uh, Ibrahim Ahama's work in the in Nashville in the Fisk University. Paul. I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in. You should feel under no obligation to uh, <laughs> include me. In we this. love hearing you. <laughs> uh, I'm thrilled to listen to my colleagues. They've been saying wonderful things. I'll just add one thought that I think might crystallize some of what people have been saying. Um, drawing on the thoughts that I shared with you earlier. One way to think about the work of achieving or building or sustaining or caring for our publics in the spirit that I discussed earlier is to think of the public as a step on the road to community, right? Mm -hmm. Publics are what we inhabit when we recognize the shared conditions of our lives. Communities are what we build when we mobilize ourselves to attend to those shared conditions, right? So the public is a step from cohabitation to community. And some of the wonderful things people have been talking about are opportunities to use art and art practice and art institutions to move from cohabitation to community. And that's tremendously exciting. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for making the distinction and this step between public and community in the hope for communities to come and in, in the hope to achieve communities, to achieve fresh net networks and communities based on empathy and resonance. And before we go to the making of video of Ibrahim Mahama's work, I want to ask Magda to come back to our conversation, Manga, Magda Campos Pons that, that wanted to add to our conversation. I can Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. I cannot see myself, but I know that you guys see me. Uh, 
I want just to say thank you to every one of you for this incredible, rich, valuable, profound conversation. When I dream of EADJ, I dream exactly of what we're doing today. And back to Paul, I want to mention this phrase that he just alluded, cohabitation to communities. To have together people from every part of the world, curator from the Venas Biennale, from Creative Time, to Documenta, professor from Fisk, professor from Vanderbilt, and my students in the audience and the city, this is my ideal of cohabitation. This is my idea of aspiring to reach your public. This kind of making the global or the interplanetary on the proximity, close to us, tangible to us, is very important to me. I'm going to say briefly that 1986 was the very first year that the Venus Biennale saw work by Black artists. It took a century from 1895 to 1986 to that to happen, to have the opportunity to see what Oki went to do, Oki on Wesso, what Cecilia is doing this year, what Elvira have done, what Marina have done. This is my idea of cohabitation. I also want to say that Ibrahim Mahama brought us to us a performative piece of the body in geography. This virtual visit that he brought to us in the bottom of the building in Tamales is the kind of proximity an artist not only being emissaries of a future, that was the futures of knowledge of art that Oki and Wesso was dreaming. No one he did the Biennale in 2015, but he was talking about that in 1994, 1992, 1993 as a poet in New York. So I am here full of uh, energy and emotion and, and seeing the value and the perseverance. Perseverance is in March, but the perseverance of us people here in the ground making this possible, it count. In making the idea, we throw too that the accent of archive of black agency has been so important, has been so in this, on the no care. So I made to myself that an archive was going to be central to EADA. So the video that you saw, that you see it now is just a artistic piece by a very young artist in our town, Alexander, and he just follow what is the making, the labor that we put into place to bring to Vanderbilt and to bring for Fisk University in the ground of Du Bois, this Ghanaian young artist who is doing the same work, imagining, fighting, producing, and proposing new possibility as Du Bois did, as the Jubilee singers did in, in Fisk University years ago. So without you, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Marina, for your work. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Elvira. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Yamal. Thank you, Barbara, for translating the team behind us. And let's see this beautiful piece that Liz Sander have done on uh, Ibrahima. I just want to ask a thank you to Okwi and Ezra because it's where we first saw the work of Ibrahim Mahama. He's not with us now, but because of him, the work is also here in Nashville. Thank you and bye-bye. Occupation series was actually um, a series or body of work that I did from the year 2012 to the year 2015. And within that period, I started working with the jute sacks, which uh, originally produced in Southeast Asia. 
in India and Bangladesh and they are transported to Ghana where they are mostly used by the Ghana Cocoa Board to transport cocoa from the produce buying companies to the uh, port where the cocoa is offloaded into containers and then it leaves for the west and the bags remain in Ghana. But when the bags remain in Ghana, they are no longer used to transport cocoa. They are used to transport maize, millets, yam, onions and other things across borders within West Africa because uh, Ghana is the second highest producer of cocoa in the world and that is one of the highest um, one of our it contributes to our GDP and uh, in the 20th century mid, mid parts Ghana was the largest producer of cocoa in the world and a lot of the money that was gotten out of making cocoa was what was used in building the early infrastructure in the post independence era but many years down the line of course there's been a decline because in the 60s, during the era of industrialization, our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was building these uh, series of uh, silos with the Eastern European um, architects and construction team to somehow liberate the continent with regards to uh, economics, like uh, economics and all that. So Kwame Nkrumah was trying to somehow lead us towards economic independence. So by building these massive infrastructures, like these silos where the grains and cocoa could be stored in and later on sold at much better prices on the world market. But I guess that was one of the things that got Kwame Nkrumah overthrown because he was somehow looking at the liberation of the African continent connected to the building of infrastructure. So the occupation series was born out of it in a way that uh, these politics, I believe, were somehow embodied within the the material, which is the jute sack, because this sack, which is used to transport cocoa once, but cannot be used anymore, and the cocoa beans leave, but yet still, we all have, you know, a lot of black people try to cross the Mediterranean from Africa, and they end up dying in the ocean because they don't believe there are opportunities here for them. So. The beans which go, but yet the proceeds, the capital, is never really felt. The bag which is left and used to transport many other things gets to a point through maize, charcoal, it gets to a point where it almost seems as if you cannot do anything with it again. That's when I become interested in it, when it is used to transport charcoal, because at that point you can no longer do anything worse to the material. I felt that the material had transformed from carrying the beans, which is the bean, B-E-A-N, B-E-A-N, actually, into becoming a bean, which is B-E-I-N-G, which is now like a living thing. And referring the living thing, which is this material, back to the architecture, which is these old massive grain silos, which were constructed but never used and were abandoned. Um, yeah, but in the beginning, I was just interested in the materials just as they are, as new living things, which somehow speak to us about history and time and also about the, the role that they perform in the society, about re re reminding us about certain collective histories and memories and how we can somehow create new trajectories. So I started working with a series of collaborators, people whose very conditions are somehow uh, reflected through the materials, transformation and character, and sewing these together um, and then negotiating with city authorities to cover large buildings, bridges, uh, theatres, uh, football pitches, wherever that people could access the work. And for me, the accessibility of art was very important because coming from a society where there wasn't much, because there were no public institutions or something like that, I felt that it was really important to be able to make a work that somehow could, in a way, undermine art itself. Because I always thought that art was a bit elitist in its way, and its form, the way it was created, the way it is shown mostly within the institutional context and all that. So um, I wanted somehow to bring a certain element into the work that could somehow allow for people to have conversations which were 
outside the context of art. So normally when these works are shown on in the market spaces, for instance, covering food stuffs, commodities and things like that, when people see these works, they don't immediately think art, they think otherwise and then through this conversation maybe art becomes something that becomes important within that period. So the occupation series developed over the years and then um, I, when I was invited to Venice in 2015 by Okuin Wezo to work on the All the World's Futures, it really, after doing that exhibition and like really going much deeper into the art world, I realized that it was really important for me to expand the context of the work. So I started expanding the research work around the material, looking into the histories of it and the buildings that they were connected to in the past in the 60s. So uh, during the coronavirus last year, when it started, there was one of the buildings that the government was selling, which was this old silo built by the Russians back then. And I uh, acquired the building in order to transform it into like a cultural institution. Already I had started building two institutions, SEC Tamale and Red Clay, which were actually being constructed during the period I was doing the occupation series because uh, the reason why I called them the occupation series was because I thought that it would be it was quite interesting to think that the material which seems not important at some point it can somehow uh, through art and uh, um, capital come back in time to be able to intervene within the conditions within the society so using the capital from the work to be able to build cultural institutions or parks or public spaces which ordinarily maybe children within this generation or the generation what is yet to emerge wouldn't have access to and would end up asking the same questions that we asked when we were children but I always thought that art could somehow be revolutionary if it somehow counterpoints itself. If art is uh, very much self-critical and is able to critique itself, it can somehow maybe lead us to another point of um, yeah, thinking about new forms that art can take beyond the beyond what the market proposes, beyond what capital allows to be the uh, yeah the order of the day. Yeah, so. Um, Currently, um, the occupation series has taken a different form, which is um, intervening within old systems, inf uh, infrastructure, institutions, museums, collective spaces, and all that, and trying to find ways in which artists can take more critical steps and roles and making maybe public interventions through infrastructure that can somehow change the way that we perceive uh, history and time. And maybe through that, uh, there will be a new generation of um, people who will develop a different, kind of, a different kind of consciousness that will change the way the world actually um, works. Thank you.